So again, this is our fourth week. Uh, we've already hit on the Lord's Prayer the, for the last three. And so this passage of scripture, though, that Jesus teaches us, you know, it is known by millions of people. It's very familiar. It's been used in movies, TV shows. It's been used at all kinds of funerals as well. But here's the thing. Familiar words don't always lead us to correct actions or beliefs, do they? And you know that because you've seen it in your life. You know, people swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And then they follow that with lies. Anyone here ever lie? Yeah, we all have, haven't we? You know, you think about just how easy it is to lie and what a slippery slope that is. For a moment, just think about it. Has anyone ever maybe, I don't know, said, oh yeah, I'm walking out the door right now. And uh, you stayed about 20 minutes extra at work, right? Anything like that. Oh, I'm leaving the house right now. I'll, I'll see you soon. And then something happens and you don't wind up leaving the house. Harmless or not, it's still a lie. That's how God sees it, right? And I bring that up just about how an innocent thing like that, that we think is innocent, it opens doors for a more slippery slope and thinking, okay, well, I got away with that. So what's the next step? You know, I can maybe take that one step further. Your money, it reads, in God we trust. And then people don't trust God with their money, right? Our purpose in learning the Lord's Prayer is not just to know the words, but to live them out, to let them be a guide, not only for our lives, but in our prayer time as well. And so today we enter into what I believe is the most convicting line that Jesus teaches us here when he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Or maybe you've heard it, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. All kind of the same meaning there, right? Forgive us our offenses, forgive us our sins, forgive us for all the hurt, God, that we've caused. God, forgive us in the same manner that we have been forgiven to, and that we can show that forgiveness for those who have sinned against us. That's a very tall order, isn't it? And unless someone is simply blinded by their own sinfulness, I think everyone pauses when they consider the gravity of this prayer, especially as we get to this part. Almost as though Jesus knows that we're going to have trouble processing that part of the prayer. So what Jesus does is he finishes out the teaching of the Lord's Prayer, and then he circles back to it directly after teaching it in verses 14 and 15. And he circles back to this issue of forgiveness and debt and how we are to forgive one another. So I think it's safe to say he does not ease our concerns here. He doesn't backtrack on what he touched on in the prayer. What he really does is he doubles down on the supreme importance of forgiving one another. Jesus is starting to wrap up this teaching of teaching him, the disciples how to pray. And I think most of it's pretty straightforward, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We have a loving Father who's created us. Hallowed be your name. Keeping that name, Hallowed. And we talked about what that means in the first week of this series. And then we talked about, uh, Seth had a great message on uh, thy kingdom come and what that means. That God's kingdom has come in Jesus once. And that's why we know these promises for our lives. We know God is faithful, but we also pray for God's kingdom to come and that his will be done in our lives because his will is far better than ours. And last week we talked about daily bread and all those things that God blesses us with. We talked about rehearsing the goodness of God as well in our prayer life, uh, reminding ourselves just how good God has been to us. And I think that's really important because it reminds us again of the faithfulness of God. So all these up to this point have been fairly intuitive for the people of God to pray. But when Jesus teaches us about how we ask God for forgiveness, there is a massive curveball. And the question becomes, why should we pray like that? To answer that question, Jesus in Matthew 6, 14 to 15, that's that verse that he wraps back into the prayer. He says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. To put it as clearly as possible, if we refuse to forgive other people, the father will not forgive your sins. I don't know how to be any clearer than that. Jesus is being that direct and that straightforward with us today. It's pretty high stakes, isn't it, when you think about it? Why is this one thing so critical to Jesus that he would go as far to say this? Well, this is why. Because forgiveness of sins is at the very center of everything that God has planned from the very start. It's the very center of everything that Jesus came to do. I mean, Jesus is given the name Jesus according to Matthew 1.21 because he will save his people from their sins, Right? 
And how does he save us from our sins? By dying for us on the cross, dying for our sins, and thus securing our forgiveness. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. He says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This covenant that God has established with us through the sacrificial death of Jesus is all about forgiveness. This was Jesus' entire mission. The reason the Son was sent into the world to save the world and not condemn it. It was a mission of forgiveness. So I want to take just a few moments here, a few minutes to expand upon this, because I think it's important to understand just how central uh, this whole thing is to God's heart. Forgiveness is not only the plan and not only the mission of God and Jesus, but it's the eternal plan. It's the eternal mission of Jesus. At the very beginning of Ephesians 1, Paul lays out uh, an amazing eternal and spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. The plan of God to save and forgive and to make a way back to heaven for his people. And these spiritual realities all wrapped up in this word forgiveness. And so Ephesians 1, 3 to 6, it says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. And so we see the eternal plan of God before the foundation of the world, how he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, how he chose us in love despite our sin, that we should be holy and blameless through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and how God has brought us into his kingdom through adoptions as son and daughters of his. That sounds like a God that's worthy of our praise, right? Absolutely. But in the midst of all these amazing blessings is the blessing of forgiveness, Going on in verse 7, it says, In him, in Jesus, we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And I love this part, that he lavishes upon us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under Christ. So part of the eternal package of grace that we have is through Jesus and the redemption and the forgiveness that he offers to us. We're redeemed by the blood that he spilled. And our trespasses and our sins, they are forgiven. Those blessings that we have were the eternal plan of God. So forgiveness is a huge deal, especially when it comes to God. Anyone ever received a care package before? Maybe in college, military, at camp? Anyone? Me, I did. Freshman year of, uh, at the University of Wyoming, really far away from home. Uh, I got a taste from home. My parents sent me this really nice care package with all of my favorite things in there, all my favorite snacks. And while it didn't last more than 30 minutes, because I <laughs> went through that pretty quickly, uh, it was just amazing, right? All my favorite things were in there. This gift of forgiveness is like an eternal care package that God has sent for us in Jesus. And the best part is it never runs out, Right? You can never out God's grace. You can never out God's grace. Now, does that mean that we should just go on sinning in our lives, right? Oh, God's got this covered, right? Paul would say, by no means, right? We don't take advantage of this grace that's been given to us. Instead, we know as Christians, we know through faith that when we do mess up, we can return to a loving Father who offers this to us. And the best part is God doesn't leave you wondering. He tells you right then, right there, when you confess your sins, that you are forgiven, that you are loved, that you are his child. It's like the package is Jesus and all the stuff inside are these good things that we've received as a result of having that forgiveness that was won for us by Jesus. And because forgiveness is the eternal plan of God, there's a sense in, in which we need forgiveness. Uh, it drives the entire storyline of the Bible. God creates everything in Genesis chapter one and two, and he calls it very good. And then the very next chapter, Adam and Eve sin against God, violating his command. And in many ways, the rest of the Bible is God providing a way in which sinful humanity can somehow have their sins forgiven and enter back into a right relationship, a right standing with God. And sacrifices for forgiveness, they start early in the Bible. They are primitive with the head of the family basically acting as the priest for the family. You remember the story of Job 
There in the first chapter, he offers sacrifices after every feast for his children, just on the off chance somehow that they had sinned or they had cursed God in their hearts. And so here we have this ancient dad slaughtering animals so that his children could have forgiveness. Then with Moses and the tabernacle, we have a more uh, systemized way that the people of God could have their sins forgiven. They offer the blood of bulls and goats to purify themselves. And of course, we know that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin, but all those sacrifices were connected and looking forward to that perfect sacrifice that would be in Jesus. The people offering these animals as a sacrifice in faith that the Messiah would come, that the innocent lamb of God would die a death so that we could have our sins forgiven. That was the whole point of the sacrificial system. And then Jesus comes, and his whole mission is about forgiveness. He dies on the cross in our place for our sins, to purchase our forgiveness. And when Peter's preaching the gospel to Cornelius and his family in Acts chapter 10, Peter says that he, Jesus, commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge uh, the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Revelation 5, it talks about Jesus being the Lion of Judah that rules over all things. It talks about him in the same chapter being the innocent lamb that has been slaughtered for us. And for all eternity, it seems that we're always going to remember what God has done for us in Jesus and the victory that he's given us. And the best part about that is we get to start celebrating that here and now in the way that we live our lives and showing people the kind of love that we've been shown. Maybe some of you are saying, Pastor Stephen, why are you going on about this? I mean, yeah, we get it. Forgiveness is a big deal. Well, that's why I keep going on and on about it, because it's not just a big deal. It's everything. It's absolutely everything to you and to me. Without it, we're nothing. I want you to see that the architecture of all of history, eternity past, Everything from creation until now, all of eternity future, revolves around forgiveness. It's the grand design of God, forgiving people for our sins against him, not because of works, but because of Jesus and the grace and the mercy that flow from faith in him. That is the grand plan of God. So when you have someone who says they love God and they love Jesus, but they can't bring themselves to forgive other people, what you have is someone who's missing uh, really the entire picture of God's eternal plan through Jesus. It'd be like skimming over uh, just the footnotes of God's plan and thinking that you just missed a minor detail when in all reality, what you did is you missed the title of the book. It'd be like a kid who loves the Dallas Cowboys. Hang with me. Has all the gear, watches all the games, right? Posters all over the wall, footballs in his room, wears a cowboy jersey and a friend comes over and says, hey, you wanna play catch? You wanna play some football? He's like, nah, I don't like football, right? Yeah. Friend's like, What? Starts pointing to all the cowboy stuff, not just the jerseys that he's wearing, but the hats, the memorabilia. See, the point of the cowboys is football. If you don't like the game of football, then what's the whole point? And look, yeah, I can't believe I just related God's forgiveness to the cowboys. <laughs> Lord knows as a cowboy fan, we need it sometimes. But I think you get what I'm trying to say here. Forgiveness is at the core of the Bible. And it is the gospel message. It's why Jesus teaches us, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. All right, that's the first part. And I want that just as it, we read, to lavish over you, okay? When you repent, when you ask God for forgiveness, it is instant, fully forgiven, slate wiped clean, and you are loved. So I want to ask you when it comes to the second part here. When it comes to forgiving someone, where do you draw the line? That's the question before us today. It's a good question. It's one that's asked in our gospel reading today as well. It's asked uh, the question by one of Jesus' closest disciples, Peter, when he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? That's a tough question too, isn't it? especially because it hits home for each and every one of us. I mean, how many of us here haven't been repeatedly lied to, stolen from, or cheated by another? So this is a fair question. And Jesus, he had explained to the disciples the importance of forgiving those who sin against them in this prayer. 
as their Father in heaven has forgiven them. So it's natural for Peter to want to get it right, to get it straight, right? And so you can imagine him being like, okay, Lord, but how many times am I supposed to buy this sorry stuff when they do it again and again and again? That's really what Peter's asking. When is enough enough? What about you? Have you ever asked that in your life? I have. What answer did you come up with? (laughs) Still working on it? Peter was ready with his. He said in verse 21, up to seven times, Lord? Should we even forgive someone that much? You know, I love Peter. I really do. I like reading his stories. I can't help but picture him kind of puffing his chest out when he said this. I bet he thought he was being far too generous, even for Jesus, especially since the Jews were kind of known for the three strikes and you're out uh, program. So seven times was well more than double the competitions. So imagine his shock when Jesus answers in verse 22, that I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. And by the way, that's a better translation than the NIV of 77 times that you'll find. So if you're already got the count up to 76 on someone, you're ready to cut them off at 77, well, you still have about 414 more times to go. And I know that's disappointing for some of you, right? Especially as you think about that person you're thinking about right now who deserves to be cut off. But if God were sitting up there right now with this chart in his hand, counting off all the crimes that you've ever committed against him, even at 490, how many counts do you think you got left? Obviously, Jesus isn't meaning to be taken literally here. Here's the point that he's making. There's no limit to God's forgiveness. And that means there should be no limit to yours as well. Forgive, he says, as I have forgiven you. Now, with this teaching, there's a really important part that we need to talk about, okay? Forgiveness should be offered at all times. You know, many times when when you withhold forgiveness, it does more harm to you than it does to the person that you're withholding it. The weight that you carry, the anxiety that you have over it, it's a lot. The stress. And what God is saying is, let that go. Forgive as I have forgiven you. Now, I say that, and God, he wants us to do that. However, there is a little point here that if you are in a relationship with somebody, if you have a friend, and they are continually causing you to sin by what they're doing, they are continually hurting you emotionally, physically, spiritually, God says forgive. Absolutely. Absolutely. But there are things called healthy boundaries that you can set up to make sure that you don't continue to fall into these sins, right? That you don't hold that weight, that you don't hold that resentment. You can forgive somebody and love them from afar. You can be there ready and willing to share Jesus with them whenever they're ready. But forgive as I have forgiven you, Jesus says. And he drives home this point right after telling Peter all these things in the parable. Matthew 18, 23, we read that therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. I don't care what day and age you live in, 10,000 bags of gold is a lot of money, right? And a lot of gold. In fact, it's equivalent to about 15 years of wages. And we aren't told how this man ever came to owe this much, but the point is this man had a history, a history of borrowing without repaying. And now he owed more than he could ever hope to pay back. And so we read on, Jesus is telling us this parable. He says, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Quite the repayment plan, isn't it? The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. So obviously Jesus is making a couple of comparisons here. Did you notice the similarity between the master and God? How about between you and the servant? Every single sin of our lives is a debt owed to God. So take a moment and count them up. It's way more than 490, isn't it? Aren't you glad that he's not keeping track? Then why do we? How come we keep the track of the sins of others? See, that's kind of the point of this parable. While this master had all the power to take away the servant's freedom forever, 
he chose instead to use his power to forgive. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, forgive others 70 times seven. Don't do like the servant went on to do. Instead of appreciating this incredible forgiveness of his debt and ingratitude, then going and forgiving others, this guy, he went on the hunt for someone who owed him money. And when he found him, he started beating on him, trying to get that one day's wage owed to him. 15 years forgiven. And he goes and tries to get one day's wage from someone else. Pretty sad comparison, isn't it? Compare what God has forgiven you and me for. And for what we sometimes refuse to forgive others for. It could be for a whole host of reasons. As we often say, we're trying to protect ourselves from getting hurt again. Or it's because we truly believe, we don't believe that the other person's sorry. Or maybe it's because we kind of just like the power that we wield when we don't forgive I remember a story that my mentor, many of you know, Pastor Marty had shared with me, and many of you have maybe heard this before, but it comes from a book that he shared with me called Will Daylight Come? And it's by Richard Hoffler. And it's a good illustration of forgiveness and power, uh, that the power it wields in that book. And it goes like this. A little boy was visiting his grandparents and was given his first slingshot. Right? He's out in the back and he's in the woods, he's aiming, he's letting it go, and he's not hitting a thing. Never. And so he gets a little discouraged. And he's walking back to grandma's house and he sees grandma's pet duck just over there in the yard. And so he says, hmm, let's see. Pulls it back, lets it go. Wouldn't you know it? Hits the duck in the head and the duck falls dead. Scared of what might come next, he goes and he hides that duck in a, a wood pile only to turn around and see his sister Sally had been watching the whole thing. Right. <laughs> After lunch that day, Grandma had uh, said to Sally and this little boy that she needed help washing the dishes. And Sally piped in and said, Johnny wants to do it, don't you, Johnny? Whispering, remember the duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing. Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help make supper. Sally smiled and said, oh, that's all taken care of, Grandma. Johnny wants to help do that again. And again, whispering, remember the duck. Johnny stayed while Sally went fishing. After several days of Johnny doing both of his chores and Sally's, finally, he couldn't stand it anymore. He confessed to Grandma, I killed the duck. And Grandma's reply was, I know, Johnny. I was standing at the window. I saw the whole thing, right? Because I love you and I saw immediately how sorry you were, I forgave you. I was just wondering how long you were going to let Sally make you her slave. <laughs> Refusing to forgive someone is an abuse of power because it takes away their freedom. It enslaves them and puts them behind bars. It keeps them from growing and knowing the freedom of forgiveness. This isn't how God intends for us to live, either to be enslaved by sin or to abuse the power of forgiveness to enslave someone else. The power of forgiveness is meant to give life, not death. Freedom, not imprisonment. There was a very famous Christian theologian, St. Augustine, who did something unique on his deathbed. He had one of his friends paint on the wall opposite of his bed uh, the words from Psalm 32, too, that said, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. And as Augustine laid there, reading those words again and again as he died, all the while being reminded that his debt to God had been canceled, knowing that through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he was forgiven and could in peace and confidence move from this life to the next. That's power. Is there anything more important in this life than to know that when you ask God for forgiveness, that you are given it instantly. That he hears you, that he sees all the bad that you've done, yet in love, through what Jesus has done, he calls you his child. 1 John 1, 8 to 9 reminds us, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. That's that old uh, metaphor, right? If you point at somebody and point out their sin, how many fingers do you have looking back at you? Three. If you claim to be without sin, you're only deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you. But if you confess your sins, it says God is faithful and just and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
So I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful for every promise that God gives us, how faithful he is to those promises. But how many he gives us in the Bible about forgiveness? If he kept a record of your sin, of any of our sins, none of us could stand before a holy God. But because of Jesus, we stand holy and blameless in his sight and our sins are removed from us as far as the east is from the west and placed on the cross of Jesus, on Jesus himself. And we need his strength. We need this power to fulfill one of God's most beautiful requests that he makes through the apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.32. He urges us, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. How would our world look different if we lived this out? How would marriages look different if we forgave the way that Christ forgives us. There's a man in history who lived by these words. He was a man of incredible power, and there's a story told of when Louis XII became king of France. He created a list of all of his enemies. On this list, he marked against each of their names a large black cross. When word went out that he made a list, all of his enemies ran. Because think about it. To be on a list that the king has made with a little mark next to your name probably doesn't give you a very easy feeling, does it? Always looking over your shoulder. But Louis XII, hearing about their fear, sent word to each of them, letting them know that he had pardoned them. That cross beside each of their names was a reminder of the cross of Christ. If Christ could forgive them, he figured, so could he. So that's my encouragement to you this week. In your prayer time, Pull out a sheet of paper. Start with your name. Write it down. Make the sign of the cross next to it. Remind yourself that God completely and fully forgives you. And then write that name down. You know the name of the person you're having trouble forgiving. And then put a cross next to that name. No matter their crime, no matter their history, put a cross there. That's your reminder of what God and Jesus did for that person too. And that's forgiveness. That's power, real power. And it's why Jesus can help us when we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's in his name, amen. Let's pray.